Good morning and welcome to Sunup. I'm Dave Deacon and as you can tell the crops are coming right along this time of year and so is the potential for insect pressure. Sunup's Curtis Hare caught up with extension entomologist Tom Royer to see what producers should be scouting for in their fields. The uh, situation with sugarcane aphids is, I, I think is really amazing. Over the last few years it went from being a huge crisis to um, this year we're finding them in some, soy, uh, some sorghum fields, but they're at really low levels. And I think it's because of the widespread adoption by producers both in uh, Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas of uh, adopting resistant varieties and maybe altering their planting uh, timing a little bit so that they're planting a little bit earlier. And so this has gone from a major pest to uh, yeah, it's something that we've seen this year, but it hasn't shown up in any kind of numbers at all to be concerned about. So while that, uh, the sugarcane aphids aren't really an, have been an issue, uh, some producers who double crop soybean after canola are having some issues with chinch bugs? Yes, they did. I, I had uh, a producer, uh, several producers that had false chinch bugs, which really like canola. Um, when the canola gets harvested, they don't have anything to eat, so they uh, tended to move over into soybeans that were double planted and as those seedlings were coming up they were just attacking them and, and glomming onto them to the point where seedlings were struggling to get started growing um, and they had to be treated. The same kind of issues kind of happened with uh, sorghum when, it cut, when it's planted after wheat. Uh, true chinch bugs uh, uh, get in there in wheat and then they move into sorghum and sorghum's pretty sensitive to them so We've had some issues uh, this year with uh, producers having some chinch bug issues that are causing a little bit of injury to their sorghum as it's trying to, to, to grow and um, get bigger. So uh, a storm just moved through here and in some parts of the state's getting a lot of rain, some parts of the states are pretty, mm -hmm. still pretty dry. How does rain impact, or lack thereof, impact uh, crops in regards to insects? Well, rain, uh, adequate rain, of course, makes the crops healthy and they can withstand pests. Um, when they're under stress from, drought, from uh, lack of water, that also makes them a little more uh, susceptible to, to pests attacking them. And then we have uh, 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 insects like grasshoppers that, that tend to do better um, under dry conditions, especially if you have dry conditions year after year. It allows them to build up and escape some of the diseases and that, uh, the things that typically knock them back. The, the biggest issues with grasshoppers um, is a timing of any kind of application. There are some products that work pretty well on them, but uh, if a producer has um, control over large areas, um, there are some really effective products that aren't very hard on uh, other natural enemies or birds or anything that are in the area, especially in rangeland, where they can um, spray a, a product in strips the grasshoppers move back and forth and you can reduce them that way and it's a fairly inexpensive way to control them. But the producer has to have access to pretty, uh, you know, large areas to be able to have that be effective. Alrighty, thanks Tom. And if you would like a link to any of that information that Tom talked about, go to our website sunup.okstate.edu. Forage sorghums are plants that are grown here in the southwest part of the United States very often uh, for hay crops uh, because they, they produce a large tonnage per acre e each year. Forage sorghums are uh, plants that we have some concerns about during the, the hot parts of July and August in terms of if they become stressed then they can accumulate high levels of the toxin nitrate and that, of course, can be deadly to cattle. Through the years, we've learned a lot about uh, nitrates and, and how to manage around them. One of the myths, however, that I think we ought to clear up today is about the time of day that these plants would be harvested having an impact on nitrate concentration. You see, for years, many people thought that if we cut this hay crop 
late in the afternoon or early evening hours, that that would reduce the nitrate concentration that might be in any kind of stressed uh, forage sorghum plant. Research was done here at Oklahoma State University at, at five different locations where we took samples of plants at two hour intervals at those different five locations. We did it starting at 8 a.m. in the morning, every two hours through 6 p.m. in the evening, and then took those samples to the OSU laboratory to be tested for the nitrate concentration. What we found was tremendous differences in the nitrate concentration from the different farms that were tested. But as far as the time of day, it had very, very little difference. If you look at this particular graph, you'll see lines for across the, the daytime, the amount of nitrate concentration from those five different farms. You'll see one that was very, very low, around 400 parts per million, one that averaged nearly 9,000 parts per million, which of course uh, could have some uh, dangerous areas as far as nitrate toxicity in it. You want to remember that uh, most laboratories consider 10,000 parts per million as potentially lethal for cattle. So I think we want to, uh, as we're harvesting this forage this year, number one, test it before we cut it, because once we cut it, that nitrate concentration is going to stay the same. And we don't need to expect that that nitrate concentration is going to be lowered by the time of day at which we cut the plants. We hope this helps you as you harvest those kinds of forages this summer. And we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Forage quality is changing this time of year, and it's important to add a supplement to uh, to the feed. And, and Dave, Oklahoma Gold is a program that, that, that producers could look at. They ought to be looking at it as an option this time of year. Uh, that program has been well proven, established for a long time, uh, been very popular here in Oklahoma for good reason. Uh, probably applies mostly this time of year to uh, fallborn wean calves, which is what we've got here in the background. It applies to uh, those weaned heifers that are, are in development and getting ready for breeding this coming fall. And also yearling cattle that are waiting to be shipped here sometime in the middle of the summer. Talk about some of the, uh, the ingredients that go into it and the science behind it. Okay, the um, forage quality, as you mentioned, is declining. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, even though uh, there's a lot of lush green grass out here, the protein concentration in these native species generally about this time of year begins to fall below about eight to nine percent crude protein. These cattle gaining two pounds a day require, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of nine and a half to 10. And so protein will limit their gain to under two pounds a day. Now, if we can provide the Oklahoma Gold Supplement, mm -hmm. it's high in protein concentration. Uh, it's about 38% crude protein. So it's high in protein concentration. And then it, we also uh, include uh, uh, feed additive, which the options are primarily uh, Rumensin or Bovitec. Those two products add about, mm, on average, the science would say about 0.17 pounds of additional weight gain. The protein adds another 0.4. So you add those two things together and you're right at six tenths, just under six tenths of a pound a day increase in weight gain out here on this mid to late summer forage. The cost uh, delivered, you know, somewhere around 375 to maybe 400, so we'll say 385. Mm -hmm. Cost per day if you're feeding a pound a day is about 19 cents. If you do the math, that six tenths a pound to add a weight gain is going to be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of, oh, 60 cents, uh, right. maybe 50 to 70, depending on the market. So very cost effective. Adding the feed additive, Rumensin or Bov Bovitec, costs about a little over a penny a day. Mm -hmm. And then if you do the calculations, the value of it is getting close to 20 cents. So it's very cost effective. So for a, for a little bit of money per day per cow, 
you can actually continue that growth that, that they need this time of year. Yeah, they might be limited uh, this time of year to a pound and a half a day due to the protein concentration. Uh, with the feed additive and the protein supplement, you can, you can bump that to over two pounds a day. So add six tenths of a pound and, it, and it's again, it's cost effective. Okay, thank you much, Dave Lawman, for talking through the, uh, the Oklahoma Gold program. And for more information on that, you can go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Wes Lee, here with your weekly Mesonet weather report. We're now in the middle of summer and temperatures are soaring, especially in the west. Tipton and Granfield already had 43 consecutive days above 90 degrees as of July 17th, and it will only get worse from there. For livestock producers, being able to supply an adequate amount of drinking water in the heat is critical. To do this, a producer needs to know two variables. How much will the animal drink and how much water is lost due to evaporation? A common rule of thumb for cattle is two gallons of water per 100 pounds of body weight in hot weather. For evaporation, a common method used is called pan evaporation. This is where a small metal tank is filled with water each day and water loss due to evaporation is recorded. Weather factors such as temperature, wind speed, sunlight, and humidity all can play a factor. Mesonet pan evaporation values for July 17th show Worcester in the east had a .22 inch loss. Paul's Valley in the middle lost 0.34 inches, and in the west, Hollis had 0.43 inches of evaporation. If you had a small metal trough, I would use these pan evaporation numbers directly. Now here's Gary with an update on the moisture situation. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. Well, I've been talking about it for weeks and weeks, but it is unfortunately starting to come true. We are seeing that drought start to intensify rapidly across eastern Oklahoma, especially northeastern and southeastern Oklahoma, but also along the Red River. And of course, southwestern Oklahoma is now the uh, main core of the worst drought in the state. So let's get straight to the drought monitor map and see what we have. So from Osage up to uh, Ottawa County, uh, that's the area in northeastern Oklahoma where the deficits are growing uh, each day, in fact. And also southeast Oklahoma, we still have the uh, moderate to severe drought down in that area, but as we can see, southwest Oklahoma up into west central Oklahoma, we still have a large area of that extreme drought. That's the red color, um, and we might see that start to spread even more over the next few weeks. Now, if we look at the departure from normal rainfall for the growing season thus far, uh, we can see those areas uh, northeast Oklahoma, southeast Oklahoma, and also southwest Oklahoma you have a deficit of 11 inches uh, up in Craig County in far northeast Oklahoma, widespread deficits of 8 to 10 inches in that area, and widespread deficits again of from 6 to 8 to 10 inches. We have a picture from the uh, USDA of the topsoil moisture, the percent short to very short for each state. Oklahoma now at 50 percent short to very short for that topsoil moisture an 8% increase from last week, so that is an indication that our topsoils, uh, at least the, the top few inches, are starting to dry out. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Recently, there's been some changes in the crop acreage reports in Kim. What's causing that to happen? Well, I think it's the price relationships between wheat, corn, beans, milo, uh, sesame, and other crops. And you look over the last seven or eight years, uh, wheat hasn't been at near as profitable as those other crops. Uh, you go back to 2017 on corn, you know, we planted 350 million bushels. Uh, now it is down to 310 this year on the, on the uh, USDA's projections or estimates. Sorghum was uh, 315,000. It increased to 400,000 this year. 
Soybeans was uh, 655,000 in 17. It's projected to be 660,000 this year. Cotton, 585,000 acres last year, 720,000 acres wow. this year. A big change in cotton. And what's happened to wheat? Well, our average wheat planted acres is around 5.1 million. Last year it was 4.5. Uh, this year for 18-19, uh, it's projected to be 4.4 million, or down another 100,000 acres. With all those adjustments in, in, in the crop acreage, that has to be impacting the price of each of those commodities. What, what, what are we seeing with those? Well, if you look at the price impact from Oklahoma production on those commodities, it's really insignificant. However, you know, we was talking about the relationships there. Now, corn, you can, you can forward contract it for harvest delivery now for uh, somewhere around uh, $3.20 in, uh, in Oklahoma, or if you get out in the Texas Panhandle, around $3.65. That's a 35 to 40 cent under basis in central Oklahoma or a 10 over in the panhandle. Uh, corn prices, as you know, has declined uh, significantly, uh, about 80 cents over the last couple months. And I think that's because of the you know, near record uh, condition, good condition of the, of the corn crop. As we move on from corn to sorghum, where are prices at with that? Well, you look at, uh, at sorghum, it's about $3.25, plus or minus 10 or 15, depending on where you are in Oklahoma. And that includes the panhandle, where you have a premium for corn in the, in the panhandle relative to central Oklahoma. Sorghum is priced about the same. What are we seeing in, 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 the, in the soybeans in Oklahoma? We're seeing a lot of volatility, yeah. volatility and a lot of talk about it. Uh, you look at uh, soybean, uh, the futures price, it's, you know, it's went from around $10 down to, to uh, eight, something like that. Uh, USDA's price on the July WASD, they lowered it from uh, right at $10 to $9.25, took it down 75 cents. Now, part of that is because, it, you know, you're looking at uh, a, not a record, but a near record uh, per, uh, a soybean crop being produced. And you also got the China tariff situation. So how much of that 75 cents is the Chinese tariffs and how much of it's uh, anticipated production? Well, that's for, you know, discussion. I'd say it was probably 60% tariffs and 40% uh, production, but that's just a guess. And of course, one of the larger crops well, exploding in, across the state is cotton. Well, you look at uh, the cotton price right now, you've got the uh, futures market at 88 and a half cents on that December contract. You get the uh, USDA projecting the uh, uh, 18, 19 or next year's uh, uh, average price at 75 cents. At, if you can get the crop in and, and harvest it, with, that's the most profitable crop out there. But you do have to get the production. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. So during the summer months, we get a lot of calls from people wanting to know if a snake they've seen in the water, perhaps in their pond, is a water moccasin. What they're generally asking, is it a cotton mouth? Um, cotton mouths do occur in Oklahoma, but they're restricted to the eastern part of the state. So if you're in central Oklahoma, and certainly if you're in western Oklahoma, chances are you're seeing a non-venomous water snake and not a cotton mouth. Cotton mouths are pit vipers, so they're going to have a diamond-shaped or heart-shaped head. Uh, they also have a white mouth, hence the name cotton mouth. So often they will give you a warning to stay away by opening their mouth, and if you see that white, that is a cotton mouth. But by and large, most of the snakes that we encounter around ponds or streams are completely harmless. There are several species of non-venomous water snake that occur in Oklahoma, and all of them, including the cottonmouth, primarily feed on frogs, um, sometimes fish, but uh, lots of amphibians and, and even rodents that are around the pond. So if you happen to see a snake at your pond, it's probably completely harmless. The best thing to do, even if it is a cottonmouth, is just to leave it alone. As we work our way through July, the crops are coming along, and Josh, things are looking green in the crop world. Yep, yep, we're we're looking pretty good as as far as uh, a lot of our summer crops go. But but I have to say it, uh, just like I've said it all year long, is is things are are still pretty spotty. Mm -hmm. um, we do have our spots of the state where we are looking. Um, 
less good, if you right. will, you know, to where, where things just aren't as green and as perky as we'd, li we'd like to see. Um, but for a bulk majority of the state, we're, we're looking pretty good. What are we, what are we looking for in the, uh, in the sorghum crops this time of year? Well, uh, you know, with the good conditions, with everything looking good, that also brought challenges. And we talked earlier this year about weeds and, and how big of a challenge that was going to be. And it turned out that it was. And now we're talking about, about bugs, about insect pressure this late in the season. What, what kind of insect pressure are we seeing on these plants? Well, right, right here, we actually have a spot that, that it's got pretty good worm pressure. Right. Um, and what we're seeing uh, throughout this is, is uh, whether it be a fall army worm or corn ear worm, we're starting to see a pretty good buildup. Uh, and we can see that they're, they're taking to some of these heads of the sorghum plant uh, pretty well. And so what these, what these little things do is they'll actually go and start eating the grain as it's in that, uh, uh, what we call milk or a soft dough, you know, something that they can go actually bite into and, and kind of chew up. Uh, that's what they'll be doing, and, and that's, what, uh, that's what we'll see uh, around the majority of the state. And then what growers can do is if they are in that uh, after anthesis, but before we get to that more hard dough stage, growers can go and look at that little mess that, that we see right there on that flag leaf. Well, you see those little white specks? Well, that's them eating that grain. Um, and so what you can see is if you go through and you have something that looks long like that, or if you have something that, that the... Um, that the flag leaf here doesn't seem like it's doing. If you rip this back, we got a worm right there. And so if you if you take a look at, at some of these, Dave, uh, you're you're gonna find you're gonna find uh, quite a bit of worms in through here, and and they they uh, they will do some damage because they're actually eating our finished product. So we need to make sure that we're we're ahead of the curve on them. Out here at the at the Perkins Research Station, we have the sorghum, but you also have some trials on the soybean. You wanna go take a look? That'll be good. Yep. So the soybeans are actually looking pretty good this time of year. Yeah, it's 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 really odd to 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 see some of our drier areas of the state really producing some really nice uh, looking soybean uh, that we have here. But kind of like what we were talking about with the sorghum, uh, we're kind of at this stage, and so our our pest management's right. probably our number one our number one concern here. What are what are we seeing as far as pests go in the soybeans? The big thing with soybean is, uh, depending on what stage you are, our, our pests are a little bit different. The, the insect pressure is, is alive and well, and uh, we're having actually quite a bit of stink bugs oh, wow. uh, start building up. So we have a, an egg set here that is, that is actually hatched. Uh, they've gone, they've, they've, flying at, or they've flown out, they're, they're kind of in this world now. So um, really big this year, we found a lot of them last year really big thing that's limiting a lot of our soybean yields we do believe is is just stink bug pressure and, and growers not getting on those stink bugs uh, the the most difficult thing is, is finding them though you know get a get a good sweep net out or a drop cloth and actually get into and, and find those because once we actually get them identification is pretty is pretty good most of the time they're going to be what we call southern greens um, and and our threshold for southern greens is is quite high in, in soybean the soybean clean plant can can take quite of a bit of a beating on those but what we need to do is make sure that we see when they're when they're there and and start treating when they when they getting or getting at that threshold okay thank you much josh lofton cropping system specialist here at oklahoma state university Digital dermatitis, which is commonly referred to as hairy hill warts, is the leading cause of lameness in dairy cattle worldwide. It was first discovered in 1974 in Italy. It made its way to the United States in New York dairies in 1980. Now the reason I'm mentioning it today is we're beginning to see this problem more in beef cattle. Now the disease is not fully understood we do know there's three common factors. It's associated with manure contaminated environments. Uh, there seems to be some breakdown in the immune system. And lastly, there are several bacteria involved, but one that they commonly find is called treponema. Now when you see the disease, it tends to occur in the hind limbs. We tend to see it on the back side of the foot, between the toes. 
And what you'll initially see is kind of a red circular raised area, have a strawberry-like appearance. Now, if left untreated, what we'll see is little papilla grow out of this and it'll give it the appearance of a wart-like structure. So that's where we get this hairy heel warts as a common name to it. If we don't treat it then it progresses, you'll see a, just a general erosion of the skin on that back side of that foot. So how do you treat this disease? One of the things you need to be sure and do is distinguish this from foot rot. Because this disease does not respond to oral injectable antibiotics. It has to be treated topically. And if we get our treatment, start our treatment early, we have a much better chance of getting this disease under control. Now how do we prevent this disease? Well, we don't have a vaccine, so we have to rely on basically biosecurity. Make sure that these cattle are not out standing in the muck all the time. We need to make sure things are clean and we try to keep those feet as dry as possible. Some producers, if they start to have problems with this, will run these cattle through foot baths periodically and that seems to help in the control. Uh, when we're working cattle, we need to be very careful, especially if we've got hard surfaces and these cattle are forced to tur make sharp turns on these hard surfaces. Be gentle with them because that will break, make small breaks in the skin which allow this bacteria to penetrate. If you'd like some more information about digital dermatitis, just go to sunup at okstate.edu. Well, that does it for us this week on SUNUP. If there is something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From the Cimarron Research Station near Perkins, I'm Dave Deacon. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SUNUP. <laughs>